Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done 425 of them now over the last eight years. And if this is new to you and you would like to check out previous ones, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. Uh, this uh, whole program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. If you appreciate it and feel like supporting it in any amount, um, then there's a PayPal button on every page of the site, and we, we really appreciate the support we do receive. My guest today is Matthew Fox. Um, I first met Matthew a couple of years ago at the Science and Non-Duality Conference, where he gave a very inspiring talk. Matthew is a spiritual theologian, an Episcopal priest, and an activist. As a spiritual theologian, he has written 34 books that have been translated into over 60 languages. Among them, well, I won't read the titles of all the books, but I'll link to some of them on, on the BatGap page. Um, he has contributed much to the rediscovery of Hildegard of Bingen, Meister Eckhart, and Thomas Aquinas as pre-modern mystics and prophets. Matthew holds a doctorate in the history and theology of spirituality from the Institut Catholique de Paris. He's the founder of the University of Creation Spirituality in California. He conducts dozens of workshops each year and is a visiting scholar at the Academy for the Love of Learning in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, in joining the Episcopal Church over 20 years ago, and there's a story behind that which we'll get into, Matthew has been working with young people to reinvent forms of worship by bringing elements of rave, such as dance, DJ, VJ, and more into the Western liturgy. The Cosmic Mass has been celebrated over a hundred times in dozens of cities across the U.S. Um, okay, a couple of Matthew's latest books, which I read a good deal of, are A Way to God, about Thomas Merton, and Meister Eckhart, a mystical warrior for our time. So we'll be talking about Meister Eckhart and Thomas Merton in this interview and a lot of related topics. Um, just want to mention finally that Matthew teaches regularly at the Fox Institute for Creation Spirituality in Boulder, Colorado, and lives in Vallejo, California, which is, I guess, part of Oakland or near Oakland or something, is it, Matthew? It's near Oakland. Near mm -hmm. Oakland. Okay, good. So, welcome. Thank you, Rick. It's good to be with you. I'm impressed by your uh, perseverance. 425 <laughs> interviews is a lot of interviews. Well, I love doing it. You know, it doesn't feel like work. That's that's the best kind of work to have. Yeah. I do have a question for you as sure. you get started, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is where you came up with the name for this program about Buddha at the gas pump. There must be a good story behind that. Yeah, there kind of is. Um, Maybe a vision. Yeah, I was. Um, I just <laughs> got this bee in my bonnet. Is I guess that's that British expression uh, to start an interview show, and it wouldn't leave me alone. So. Um, and then I mentioned it to friends, and they thought it was a great idea. They started bugging me to keep do, you know, pursue it. And uh, at one point, I, I was, I don't know, I was thinking of something trite like awakenings or something. And um, but then I, I put out a call to friends, like, what should I call this thing? And one young fellow in his twenties, a uh, very creative guy, just shot back about a dozen suggestions. Uh, and one of them was Buddha at the gas pump. And all my friends said, yeah, that's it, call it that. <laughs> and the implication, obviously, if it's not clear, is that, you know, in this day and age, a lot of people are awakening and, and you might be pumping gas or buying groceries or something and there's a Buddha next to you, do, you know, doing the same. Um, so, you know, so that's, anyway, that's the idea. Great. So it's the, it's the everyday Buddha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh-huh, um, okay. And um, do you agree that there seems to be some sort of epidemic going on of people waking up um, in in the traditional sense but it but unlike the traditional notion it's not as exclusive and rare as it was once made out to be yes I I certainly hope that's the case mm -hmm. yeah uh, the late uh, father B Griffiths a great monk who lived over 50 years in an ashram in southern India um, he said to me one day he said the future of monasticism is with lay people Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, that's kind of what, part of what you're talking about, that the, the, the collective wisdom we have from the monastic traditions and, and so forth over the years, East and West, uh, this has to get into the streets. It has to get to ordinary folks. I think that 
we can't afford the luxury, really, of kind of um, bifurcating and having this dualism of professional contemplatives locked up in monasteries, and then the rest of us just bumping around, making really the decisions about the future of the planet and everything else. I think everybody has to imbibe uh, a contemplative practice and a contemplative spirit in order to make uh, uh, the right decisions and and to put action uh, that, that comes from a deep place into history and uh, and that isn't just a reptilian brain response of action reaction but it comes from a deeper place so and I think another way to think about that is is you I'm talking about the age of Aquarius that um, the Piscean age that we've left was dualistic I think in a dualistic age, you can talk about monks being professional prayers and the rest of us just bumping around. But in an age of Aquarius, we're all in this together. And I think that, for example, I've met over the years a lot of young men and women who in a previous era would have been monks or nuns. But instead, they are finding their way in the world and trying to bring contemplative values and uh, into practice and into action. So, yeah, I think this is happening. I would like to see it explode on a bigger and bigger scale, and I think that's what we're we're yearning for today. Good. Um, I think one of the problems is that the custodians of these ancient traditions tended to be monks, and 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 in many cases tended to intentionally exclude uh, non-monks from that custodianship. You know, um, it's it's like you're not women couldn't be priests and householders couldn't be priests and. And uh, in the Hindu tradition, similar thing that Shankara set up his tradition, but it was run by monks. And um, there was this sort of attitude that if you're really serious about enlightenment, you better be a monk and um, otherwise mm. just you know, make a living and support the monks. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, just last week we commemorated the 500th anniversary of Luther's pounding his theses at Wittenberg. Mm -hmm. And I think that was part of the Reformation's inspiration of charism, if you will, that <clears throat> it was clearly a, an attack on the monastic establishment, which at that time was at a, at a particularly low point. And um, uh, uh, so I think in some ways the Protestant Reformation was a, a first step in trying to bring, and then of course, it was really born out of the invention of the printing press. So the fact that you could disseminate literature very easily now with printing meant that lay people could read the Bible and other things and get smart. And and so all the education was not consigned to the monastic establishment. So, you know, this does have a history and part of the history is technology itself, you know. But today, again, we've had this new technological explosion, what we call the social media and the internet and everything else and um, I think there's something parallel happening and it's it's close to your original question here you know can we democratize the mystical experience and the contemplative wisdom that previously was pretty much um, kind of held uh, in um, in monastic hands and of course a lot of other things enter such as women I mean I mean a lot of monastic uh, tradition is celibate, east and west, and it's very, very male dominated. Even when you had nuns, they were still often under the control of uh, of the men. And I'm talking about Buddhism as much as Christianity. In yeah. fact, in some ways, for example, the Benedictine order in the west, such as Hildegard of Bingen belonged to, was really quite independent of the men. And that was that caused for considerable friction during the centuries. But um, so I think that's part of it, too, that the women's movement, too, in its way is saying, hey, we're here, too. We can be as contemplative and as uh, profound and wise as the men. So, uh, you know, uh, let's let's share this wisdom. So I think all this is part of the energy of our time. And it's a we do. I do like to look at things historically. It is a, a moment, you know, and not just it's not just about humans waking up about religions waking up, it's about uh, the planet suffering so much and the planet needs humans to wake up or, or we're all doomed. We're going to go down together. Uh, the planet will survive, but not with the diversity and the beauty and the, and the wonder that it currently carries if humans don't get our act together real soon. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, some people think that new gizmos are going to save us and, and obviously oh. new, new gizmos are needed in terms of better alternative energy technologies and all that. But I, I think more fundamental than that is the waking up part, which will 
give rise to greater creativity and also diminish the, the, the lethargy or dullness that tends to suppress um, innovative ideas. And just to wrap up some of your other points, um, I interviewed a couple of Buddhists a couple of weeks ago and they were saying that even in contemporary times in, in Buddhist traditions, the most senior nun in a Buddhist monastery was inferior to the most junior male monk, you know, and there was that pecking order. So yep. obviously that's got to change. And just one final point is that in my experience of interviewing 425 people um, and getting to know the people I've interviewed pretty well, I would, I would say that uh, the men don't have any advantage over the women in terms of um, degree of enlightenment or clarity of expression or anything else I can think of. So it's, it's rather absurd, I think, that there's been this patriarchal dominance uh, over the centuries. Absurd, but predictable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you find it in every other walk of life, too. It's not just the monasteries that are, uh, which say, awash in patriarchy and uh, yeah, so uh, it's it's human nature, I guess. But of course, as part of the balance, we're trying to get back, I think, into our yeah. psyches and, there, and ultimately, therefore, from there into our institutions. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a battle. But in our lifetime, you know, we can see, I certainly have seen tremendous strides uh, in in our culture with women stepping up. And then, of course, we've had this tremendous backlash uh, but that too is a sign that there's been some progress <laughs> because we can't be naive about the, well, what Gandhi said, you know, that uh, people in power do not relinquish it uh, happily mm -hmm. or, or easily. Yeah. So uh, there is going to be, a, you know, a couple of steps forward and a step back and all that. But because we're dealing with profound issues, and of course, it's not just about who's making decisions. It's also about what are our images of of the sacred in our images of the divine. And if we uh, run merely on the uh, masculine images, then that is feeding uh, patriarchy, is feeding one-sidedness. It's even feeding oppression of, of women and of children. And both boys and girls have to learn at an early age that uh, any gender ascribed to divinity is going to be metaphorical anyway, mm -hmm. but we have to ascribe the masculine and the feminine uh, together. And um, my striker says, all the names we give to God come from understanding of ourselves. So if we're content with just a male divinity image, that says a lot about us, mm -hmm. much more about us than, than God. And we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then there's a question of the toxic masculinity. So I wrote a book on the recovering the sacred masculine called The Hidden Spirituality of Men. And it's really important. It's not just bringing the divine feminine back, but it's also about cleaning up the toxic masculine, which is everywhere in our culture. I think we've over-identified masculinity with the reptilian brain. Hmm. So that ultimately masculinity in our culture is about winning, being number one. And how often do you hear this from sports people and from politicians and the rest? Um, you know, that the mammal brain has to uh, assert itself. And that is the brain of compassion and of um, kinship and cooperation rather than competition and dominance and I'm number one and, and you're not. Um, so that whole thing about taming the reptilian brain, I think is real, uh, is about the survival of our species. And this is where meditation comes in. This is where the spiritual technologies of our traditions have a lot to offer because I do think that the reptilian brain is um, like solitude. Uh, reptiles are not good at, um, at bonding, but they're very good at lying alone in the sun. Check out your alligator or your <laughs> snake. And so that's what solitude is. That's what solitude is. Um, the word for monk, it comes with the word monos, it means solitude. Mm. So there's a monk in every reptile. Mm. So that's how you get to the reptilian brain. You comment, nice reptile, nice reptile. You pet your reptilian brain. <laughs> By, by meditation. Then your mammal brain can assert itself. And of course, it's half as old as the reptilian brain. So the reptilian brain you know, thinks it's, it's dominant, wants to be dominant, it has to be tamed. The, I, I like to say the Buddha put, put a leash on our reptilian brain. That was his major accomplishment, uh, emphasizing the practices that will calm that brain. Then the mammal brain of compassion 
it can assert itself. Mm. And it's no coincidence. In both Hebrew and Arabic, the word for um, womb is the basis of the word for compassion. Mm. So the womb people, the mammals, kinship, that brings something special to the planet. And is, when I look at all of the world's spiritual traditions, whether Jesus or, or, or the Dalai Lama or Muhammad, or anyone, they're all talking about compassion. Yeah. They're all talking about the, the mammal brain. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy getting there because especially in a patriarchal context that we've inherited uh, for the last 4,500 years. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah. One thing that seems to be kind of exciting is the, um, the exposés of all these people like Harvey Weinstein and others who have been behaving very strangely and incorrigibly. And it's like everyone, all the news media pundits are kind of saying, whoa, we really seem to be at a watershed moment here. Never, things are never going to be the same after this. People aren't going to put up with this BS anymore. Um, so, you know, it's, it's sort of a hopeful sign that a, a major shift is taking place in terms of what we've been talking about, the, the dominance by and misbehavior of, of men in the culture. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, yeah, you know, um, again, a part of the, the uh, accomplishment uh, of the reptilian brain is that it does run our sexuality. Mm. But the problem in these cases is that the, our, the sexuality uh, it can be used uh, as a weapon, as a power trip. That, that's part of keeping sexuality at the reptilian brain level. Mm. But if you incorporate the sexuality into the bigger soul that humans have, including the mammal um, brain, but also our spirituality. So the whole idea of, of sacred sexuality is not about dominance. It, it is about mutuality. It right. is about love, mm -hmm. to use a term that is often overused. Yeah. But um, like the Song of Songs in the Hebrew Bible celebrates lovemaking as a theophany, as a mystical experience. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that in teachings East and West, and certainly in the indigenous cultures too. So um, to me, yeah, what we're talking about the, those revelations happening, and of course the press is so eager to jump on it. However, not, of course the press is, oh, has its own, um, oh yeah. Uh, Sure. Uh, sexual allegations too, and, mm -hmm. and issues like the head of Fox News and that the number one character at Fox News, they've all been convicted of these kinds of things. So again, yeah. it's part of the reptilian brain running wild that uh, we have to kind of direct and tame this reptilian brain. It's not about killing our sexuality or our, our desire, but it's about steering it into, a, into the bigger uh, capacities of love and compassion that our, our species is capable of. And, and it's a reminder, you know, that all men and women are capable of uh, misusing our powers, including our second chakra, our, mm -hmm. our sexuality. Um, so, yeah, it, it could be, you're very, you, you sound quite optimistic to me, but it could be a moment of awakening. I do, th I do agree. I don't think the toothpaste is going to go back in the, in the tube on this one. I yeah. do think that women, the Me Too movement, is, um, and of course the men who are coming forward too, um, it's, um, it, is, it could be a real watershed movement, yeah, to carry along the very topics of the healthy masculine and the healthy feminine, uh, respecting each other mm -hmm. and, uh, and making good things happen. Yeah, I am optimistic, not only on this point, but just in terms of how the world is going to turn out. I mean, you know, there are reputable sources now who are saying that we might not have humans on the planet by the end of the century, given what's happening with global warming. But um, based on what you, you said earlier, when we were discussing earlier, I, I think that I, um, a, a sort of an upsurge of spirituality or awakening or you know, enlightenment or whatever we want to call it is kind of coming in the nick of time to counterbalance the, the destructive direction that humanity has gone in and you know it's not a done deal but it, it gives it gives me hope and it's you know it's, and it's not making the six o'clock news either because it's subtle and, right. and the, the media right. doesn't understand this mechanics but I, I think right. something is rising to meet the challenge mm -hmm. we face mm -hmm. and um, and so I'm hopeful. I agree yeah I agree and of course interfaith what I call deep ecumenism yes um, you know I mean when you have leaders like the Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh and Pope Francis 
wandering the planet as mm-hmm. good examples of what what a healthy religion might be and and so forth you know that that inspires and the younger generation is not at all stuck well with exceptions but i mean as as an energy force i find the younger generation is not at all stuck in boxes of denominationalism and so forth mm-hmm. um that for example i have a friend who's thai and he's buddhist mm-hmm. and he teaches mathematics in high school um not far from where i live here in vallejo but actually several years ago he was 33 years old he took the pilgrimage to saint james capostello 485 kilometer walk and his his feet bled halfway through so he had to quit mm-hmm. he went home and taught the next year then he flew back and started up where he had ended and finished the the pilgrimage so this is a buddhist i asked him how many buddhists did you meet along the way either trip zero he said <laughs> and um I asked him something, you never ask a Buddhist. I said, why did you do it? So he just stared at me. See, Buddhists don't do things for a while. No good mystic does. But then I said, what did you learn? He said, well, he said, I learned God is in everything and every everything and everybody. But of course, I knew that already. He said. <laughs> but then um, he just told me recently that he's, he's thinking of going back and doing the whole thing again mm-hmm. with two or three Buddhist friends. So I point this out as, as an example. It's not just the West is learning from the East spiritually, but the East is also curious about the West. Mm-hmm. And I mean, like Christianity in China is just exploding. Yeah. And uh, of course, the government doesn't like it and doesn't know what to do about it. But the point is that the, the East is very curious about Jesus and the values that Jesus taught. After all, Gandhi said he learned to say no from the West. Mm-hmm. So the whole prophetic dimension from the Jewish and the and a tradition, which is also the basis of Jesus teaching, uh, is is very appealing today. So my point is that deep ecumenism, this 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 interweaving of Eastern and Western wisdom, is a tremendous uh, force in what you're talking about, in in the hope, uh, our our capacity for hope today, and then of course the environmental movement. I mean. I, as I wrote in my Cause of Christ book 28 years ago, there's no such thing as a Roman Catholic rainforest and a Lutheran sun and a Baptist moon and a Buddhist ocean. So once all our religions reset themselves in the context of the sacredness of creation, which is, a, I think, what the environmental uh, survival uh, requires, then we're all going to get more humble about our traditions and we're going to work together and we're going to go deeper. So I, I agree that these are all signs of hope in an otherwise, you know, pretty dark time. I mean, what climate change is doing is, is very real. I was in Jamaica a month ago, um, not on a vacation, but called to be part of a, a project dealing with uh, violence among young, young men and so forth. And um, the number one industry there is tourism, but the seas are rising. I mean, their beaches could disappear. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if we think, third world countries, so-called, like Jamaica, are in trouble now with their economy, wait until the seas rise, you know. So um, all this should be getting us out of our couches and getting us to be active uh, in defending Mother Earth, which I think is the the number one moral and spiritual issue of of our time. Yeah, and the seas are also going to rise on Miami and New York City and every coastal exactly. old coastal city in the world. I mean, exactly. hundreds of millions of people will be displaced, and it's not going to be pretty in terms of the... Exactly. I mean, it's going to make the, Sy- the Syrian migration look like a picnic. Exactly. Yeah. exactly, and you know, something the press has not told us, the Syrian migration, a lot of it is due to climate change. Exactly. Because the, the land was drying up. There's mm-hmm. a lot of drought there. And so the farmers were leaving the land because they couldn't farm, swarming into the cities. And then you had, you know, no work and you had uh, prices for bread rising. Mm-hmm. This happened in Egypt, too. A lot of the Arab Spring was due to climate change. Yeah. And, you know, the press doesn't have that consciousness, mm-hmm. did not tell us that. The same is true here. And, of course, immigration here. Uh, instead of walls, building walls with Mexico, First, you might begin by looking at satellite pictures of Central America and Mexico 20 years ago when they were green, mostly it's green, and today it's turned brown. Mm -hmm. So the same thing's happening here. People migrate when you can't work the land anymore, duh. (laughs) And so the problem is, the answer isn't putting up walls, it's doing something about climate change. Yeah, and just in case anybody listening is wondering how this is relevant to a show about spiritual awakening and enlightenment and so on 
it kind of helps to have a body in order to get enlightened, you know, or to awaken spiritually. And I think the issue we're discussing is relevant to whether bodies are going to be able to live on this planet anymore. And I also think that, um, you know, problems such as climate change, which is one of our most severe and many, many others, are a reflection of human consciousness. Obviously, humans are responsible for them. They're, they're a reflection of the general state of awareness or consciousness or mentality that humans are living in. And so, you know, we can apply band-aids in terms of trying to, you know, mess around with carbon tax credits and all that. But more fundamentally, we can shift human consciousness dramatically. And if we can really do that, then all the sort of ramifications or manifestations of an obviously deficient d level of, of development will shift automatically, kind of like watering the root of a tree and finding that all the leaves flourish as opposed to watering the leaves. Well, that's very true. And um, so many other issues arise too, for example, population. Yep. Um, and, um, I, you know, they say that when, and these are, these are proven statistics on this, when women acquire more equality in a, in a culture, the um, population goes down, mm -hmm. the, the number of births goes down, and um, alternative uh, small businesses uh, uh, arise. Mm. So there's less unemployment, there's less poverty, and there are fewer uh, children. And clearly the, the, um, the, the great numbers of human beings on the planet are, are an issue and will continue to be an issue, and especially as as we lose soil, as there are more droughts, as there are more floods. I was with a group of 150 scientists this summer at a conference for a week, and um, they were saying, you know, with climate change, the warm areas are going to be hotter and there'll be more drought, and the wet areas are going to be wetter, there'll be more floods. And in either of those cases, we're talking Houston and Puerto Rico and Miami, or if you're talking the Northwest here this summer with all these uh, forest fires, including one. 20 minutes from where I live here uh, in Santa Rosa. Um, uh, this is just uh, what this is the beginning of, of the trend. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we have to wake up. But I want to make one point though. But you said um, because you're raising that whole issue of dualism that uh, we're talking about spirituality, but we are talking about our bodies. But I don't I don't accept that dualism. I would say this it's not just our bodies that are going to suffer from climate change. Our souls do too. Thomas yeah. Barrett makes this point that our, our souls need beauty. Our souls delight at, at the wonder of the diversity of the animals. If, if elephants disappear, if tigers disappear, if polar bears and whales disappear and the forests and the rainforest, it's not just that, um, that our bodies are going to be affected, but also our souls are going to be starved. As he says, there aren't a lot of poets on the moon. Uh, you know, it's it's a beauty and diversity of this planet that inspires our musicians and our poets and our our artists and our filmmakers and and and, and lifts all of our souls. So um, anyone who thinks that a program on spirituality should not be talking about climate change doesn't understand what spirituality really is. The human being is not a disembodied spirit. The human being is incarnated. We are a flesh spirit, in fleshed spirit, and um, and so we have a responsibility to um, continue the beauty of the planet and the health, physical and mental, emotional and spiritual health of one another. That's what compassion and love means. To me, that's what enlightenment means. Yeah, good. I concur. And, um, and speaking of species going extinct, something, some species goes extinct every 20 minutes these days. Uh, they say we're in the middle of the sixth great mass extinction. And, um, and again, it's one of those things that is creeping up on us and doesn't make the news, but it's happening. Exactly. Um, exactly. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's kind of an urgent situation, really. Um, sure, that's so. Yeah. Let's do it. Oh, go ahead. You were going to say something? Well, I just was saying, why doesn't it make the news? You see, our, our you know, Pope Francis and his uh, brilliant encyclical on the environment, Laudate Si, which, by the way, I'm happy to say was written essentially by one of my students, mm. a uh, Parisian priest, uh, Irish 
missionary in the Philippines who came to our master's program in Korean spirituality, and went back and wrote a series of small books on ecology and spirituality, because the Philippines are very alert to the ecological issues. You know, they used to have the greatest amount of coral reef in the world, mm -hmm. and now 95% of it is dead. Mm -hmm. It's really sad. I remember I went swimming one day and I went down and I saw it, it was like a cemetery of coral reef, all gray, ashen, mm. used to be coral. But um, he wrote these books and the Pope plucked him out of the Philippines and took him to Rome and he wrote the Pope's encyclical. So it's interesting, as I say, I've, I lived under two popes who called my work for 34 years, called my work, quote, dangerous and deviant. <laughs> now this third Pope, Francis, is... Um, is plagiarizing my work, for which I'm Good. very grateful. Yeah. So I've lived a long life. <laughs> but my point is, Pope Francis uses the word narcissism. It's a strong word. Uh, the more familiar word would be anthropocentrism. But he's right that our species has become so self-centered, so anthropocentric and narcissistic that we operate out of that. And I think our media are a good example of that. You know, that the, and, and as it's been said, you know, the forests, the, the redwood trees, the oceans do not have a, have a vote at the United Nations, much less a vote in the Senate or, or Congress. Uh, we have to become that vote or really include them. But they also don't, don't have a vote in, um, in boardrooms of the media and so forth, you know. So who's really representing the bigger picture? Well, this is where spirituality comes in uh, and should come in. And um, so this is part of our conversation for sure. Yeah. And um, at some point soon, I want to get into a little bit of your history, but since we're on this, we'll get to it. So since we're on this point, um, as I understand the whole notion of the cosmic Christ, it's that that which Christ actually was, wasn't obviously just a body that got crucified 2000 years ago. Um, what Christ was from his inner perspective, I presume, is that cosmic intelligence, which pervades everything, and including us and in which we essentially are and you know Christ said things such as whatsoever you do unto the least of these you do unto me and that would include all the things you just mentioned oceans and forests and various kinds of animals um, you know we are if we're inflicting harm on those we're not only inflicting harm on what Christ essentially was but we essentially are in other words we're we're harming ourselves you know ask not for whom the bell tolls it tolls for thee mm -hmm. Exactly. And as Jesus said, love others as you love yourself. Because they are and, yourself. Uh, right. <laughs> and of course, if we're destroying our own air, I just heard in the news yesterday that in New Delhi, what the biggest city and capital city of India, mm -hmm. that, um, that the air they're breathing every day is equivalent to 44 cigarettes. Yep. I just imagine uh, that. I just messaged. And, and that's uh, for, imagine babies, children. Oh, yeah. I adolescents know. and the adults, 44 cigarettes for every citizen in New Delhi. I mean, how much dumber do we have to get yeah. to, you know, kick, kick some habits? I just uh, emailed with a friend this morning who lives in New Delhi, and he said he sent his children out of town to uh, some relatives in the country because he doesn't want them breathing. But he has to stay and run his business, you know. There you go. Yeah. You can't breathe anymore. That's pretty pretty basic, you know. <laughs> I, that's why I, 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 I talk about earth, air, fire, water, you know, it's all in trouble today, the air, there we go, that's a perfect example, you can't take it for granted anymore, mm. and and the water, of course, we have all these, this, uh, you know, the pollution of water, the killing of, I, I heard the other day from one scientist that by the year 2050, that's not that far away, there will be more plastic in the oceans than fish. Mm -hmm, I've heard that. Oh my God, yeah. I, as first time I heard it, it just blew the top of my head off, but <laughs> You know, so we can't take water for granted. We can't take fish for granted. Um, and of course, the, the whole issue is around fire. How, what, you know, how will we harness energy? You know, we've been harnessing it obviously through fossil fuels, and it's clear to anybody except maybe our president that um, this is a dangerous place to go. Now, every country in the world, even Syria, in the midst of a civil war, is on board for the the climate change uh, commitments of, of the Paris Agreement, but not our country. But actually, I think a good things come out of that. So many grassroots groups and so many over 3000 cities and um, states are taking strong stands, uh, standing with the Paris Accord, even though our, our, our federal government now is standing against it. But uh, all this is about waking people up. And, and this is how you began this program. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, spirituality is about waking up and um, 
uh, is waking up to the beauty and the health that we can easily take for granted on the one hand, but it's also waking up to our responsibility to change our ways, to learn to let go, to learn to sacrifice, if you want to use that word, to and to tap into the creativity that uh, that we are capable of as a species, and and to do it out of love, not out of fear, not out of um, stress, not out of demand, but but out of um, uh, the deepest capacity we have for communing with our ancestors and with our descendants, as those not yet born, mm -hmm. and with one another, no matter what our race, ethnicity, uh, tradition, uh, religion, or, or or ideology. I mean, all that is is on the horizon, I think, at this moment in human and planetary history. So it's a, a very great moment to be alive. Uh, everyone has to um, has to get on board. Relevant to the comment you just made, I, I just want to say that I uh, listen, enjoyed an interview you and Adam Bucko did together um, with someone, and Adam's been on this show. And um, Adam was saying, oh, great. yeah, Adam was saying how these days kind of spiritual people are becoming activists and vice versa, and that he felt that that balance or integration is, is really needed in, in this day and age that we can't sort of just, uh, it's sort of what we were saying earlier about um, spirituality being something that's infused into the culture in, and among the lay people, not just something for the monks. Um, it's for people who are active in the world and, and actually in, enhance and it's worth making in a general point i think that that spirituality is not just doesn't just have otherworldly benefits it's something that actually enhances your life and should make you more creative more intelligent more energetic you know more happy on all sorts of things which are useful in raising families and running businesses and whatever else you do i couldn't agree more Yes, I'm glad you had Adam Bucko on your program. He's a wonderful, yeah, he's great, wonderful young man, a great soul, mm -hmm. and um, it gives me hope to meet a lot of young people like that who are really feeling called today. It's like, as I said earlier, it's like a new meaning of vocation, it, and he's a good example that he's, he's great. as you know, he worked for 15 years on the streets of New York with mm -hmm. um, with uh, homeless young adults there, yeah. and he did such wonderful work. And it's very demanding, um, but, but he learned a lot from it. And um, uh, yeah, he's a good a good example of someone who knows what he's talking about. Yeah. And that whole idea that the, the contemplatives have to become active and the active have to become contemplative. That's, yeah. I think, the moment in which we're living. So we, we still want to talk about Meister Eckhart and Thomas Merton, but uh, I want to talk about you a little bit more first. Let's switch gears and do that. One thing I read is that you for some reason, reading War and Peace was a major <laughs> impetus in your in your spiritual waking. I, you may be the only person on the planet who can say that. I don't know. Um, but what was it about War and Peace uh, that, that was such a kick in the pants for you? <laughs> well, I was uh, between my junior and senior year of high school. And um, I remember telling a friend that it blew my soul wide open. Hmm. And... Um, I didn't know what had happened to me. Now, today I would say it was a mystical experience, but I didn't have that language. But I wanted to pursue what happened to me because I felt it was important to have my soul blown right open. And um, uh, so that had, had, had quite a lot to do with my, my vocation. Also earlier, when I was 12 years old, I had polio. Oh. And losing my legs, they couldn't tell me if I'd walk again. So for about a year, I didn't know if I'd ever walk again. And that was interesting, and that also, um, I think, was sowed some seeds for my calling, because my father actually had been a football coach at the University of Wisconsin. My older brothers were all state football players, and I figured that's what I was going to be. And then all of a sudden, I couldn't walk. So it was a, it was it was learning not to take for granted. And I remember when I got my legs back, I I was overwhelmed with gratitude to the universe. And I said, I'll not take my legs for granted again. And for me, that's that's one definition of, of mysticism, not to take for granted. Mm. Like we were talking about earlier, not to take air and water for granted and the beauty of the planet and our health. So um, those are two quite notable moments in my childhood, if you will. Um, but regarding Tolstoy, you know, Gandhi, when uh, he got to Jesus through Tolstoy, hmm. yeah. So um, uh, that's you know. So Tolstoy has had 
effect on people. But, you know, there's a great book down in him years ago, and there's a great line in that book. It says uh, about his book, War and Peace, which is a book that I read, and the, the, the commentator said, if life could speak thus, life would speak. So in other words, it war and peace, and that's what I felt. It gathered all of life. It was all in there. That's what a globalist does, you know. They tell us what, they shed light on life, which is something we can take for granted too. Mm -hmm. But it happens to us every day and, and piecemeal, so we don't get the big picture. Whereas I felt, I think, at that age, and I've been, what, about 15, that I was getting a big picture about what life is all about. Nice. And of course, since then, of course, uh, in the work I've done on the mystics and so forth, and examining my own experience, like in my first book was a book on prayer. What is prayer? And I define it as a radical response to life. But I've also found that many mystics have talked about God as life. Howard Thurman talks about God as life. Thomas Aquinas says, God is life, per se life. Hildegard of Ingen says, God is life. So, so that's one of the synonyms, of, of one of the names that we ascribe to God and divinity. And um, I think it still carries, um, carries a punch. Oh. So then you became a priest, and you were a Dominican priest for, what, 30 years or something? Some long time. Um, I was a Dominican. I, ordered, I, I joined the Dominican order. Mm -hmm. um, and this because I attended a public high school, and my friends were either Jewish or agnostic or Protestant. We often had these philosophical debates. And I'd go to my parish priest who was a Dominican, and he'd feed me books by G.K. Chesterton and Aquinas and stuff. So I liked that intellectual side to the tradition, Dominican tradition. So that's one reason I, I tried the Dominicans. So I was with them for 34 years. Mm. And, um, and then um, I was uh, silenced for a year, about my 31st year as a Dominican, silenced for a year by Cardinal Ratzinger, the head of the Inquisition under Pope John Paul II. And, um, and then a few years later, he expelled me from the Dominican order. Um, and um, yeah, and then as you mentioned, I, I, I met up with these young Anglicans from England actually, who were doing rave masses. And I really thought that was important. I asked them how I could help. And they said, if you became an Episcopal priest, you could run interference because most people don't get what we're doing, but you do. And so I thought about it. And since the Pope had fired me, I figured, well, <laughs> So I went to the Episcopal Bishop of San Francisco and said, here's what I want to do. I want to become an Episcopal priest, but only to work with young people to reinvent forms of worship. And he gave me a green light. That was Bishop Swink. Mm -hmm. And so I became an Episcopal priest um, to do that and to remain within a Christian community. I did not want, I did not want to be isolated. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to continue my work as a theologian. And so that seemed like, uh, well, they offered me religious asylum, as I put it, and I took it. Yeah. So I'm grateful to the Episcopal Church for that. It's interesting, the reasons uh, you got kicked out, uh, I have them here if you want me to read them quickly, um, that you were accused of being a feminist theologian, you called God mother, you called God child, you preferred original blessing to original sin, you did not condemn homosexuals, you preferred the four paths to the traditional three paths of purgation, illumination, and union, perhaps we can touch upon what the four paths are, and horror of horrors, you work too closely with Native Americans. <laughs> sounds like a great guy. Yeah, my, my wife says, sounds like a great guy. <laughs> well, I think it's kind of a Rorschach test about where the Vatican was at those 34 years. Uh, it doesn't say anything about divinity, but it says a lot about the Vatican under those two previous popes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and all this comes back to something that I think might tie us into a discussion of creation spirituality. And that to me is this whole notion about placing such emphasis on what a person thinks and believes as opposed to what they actually experience. And it seems to me that if we were to talk to Jesus, uh, you know, or listen, to, sit in on one of his things, uh, the, the sermons, the emphasis would not be, hey, believe what I say. It would be, I would like you to experience what I'm experiencing. Um, I don't know if we can find any passages in which he puts it that way, but I bet you that was his intention, and it probably got distorted Absolutely. through various like, translations. Like the Buddha too. Yeah. And, and the Buddha it's like, too. What, what difference does it make if you believe what they believe? It doesn't do you any good unless you actually experience what they were experiencing. Oh, exactly. And, you know, I think the key of this may be 
the word trust. Mm -hmm. In um, in the Gospels, we've mistranslated the word for trust often as faith. So on numerous occasions, Jesus heals someone and he says, go, your blank has saved you, has healed you. Right. And the blank we've translated as faith, but the real meaning of the word is trust. Mm -hmm. And trust is not something that's done vicariously. You know, you learn to trust. It's like the psalmist says, taste and see that God is good. You know, you can't taste for me. I can't taste for you. I can bring you to the beauty and say taste, but I can't do it for you. You got to do the tasting and you, we've got to do the trusting. So you're absolutely right. We've built this mountain of faith doctrines and substituted that. And then we build a religion around it. We substitute that for the experience. Jesus obviously was experiencing things. And notice his his avenue of teaching was telling parables. What is parable? You know, it's a, it's a story that invites people in, like any story invites people in. And it's not about rules. He doesn't set up a moral uh, 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 list of commandments around the stories. He just tells you a story and, and walks away. <laughs> and you're left with figuring it out and putting yourself into the story. And that's utterly participatory, which is what you're talking about, experience. And so that to me is just between spirituality and religion. Spirituality begins with the experience, taste and see that God is good. And um, whereas religion so often, it begins with doctrines and dogmas and buildings and titles and hierarchy and all the rest. And, and that's why it can so easily topple over or go, go corrupt. Uh, and it has to be continually renewed, semper reformanda, always reformed. And you know, Buddha was trying to renew the Hindu movement of his day. Jesus was trying to renew the Judaism of his day. Martin Luther was trying to renew the Christianity of his day. And uh, they all ended up leaving their religions, you might say, or at least those who followed them did, because because they couldn't fit, again, to use Jesus, image, they couldn't fit the new wine into the old wine skin. Mm -hmm. But in fact, a lot of the new wine is ancient wine. That is to say, it's, it's human wisdom to put the put compassion uh, forward instead of just revenge and getting even and, and reptilian brain dominance, mm -hmm. for example. Um, uh, so, so really, I think that, yeah, we have to do the experiencing. That's how you renew religion. This is why Carl Jung says that only the mystics bring what is creative to religion itself. So, and mysticism is about experience. It's about tasting. And uh, whether it's tasting the beauty of life, the joy and the wonder, but also the grief, the loss, the darkness, going into the dark, the dark night of the soul, which I think we're in as a collective today, as a species, the dark night of our species. What we've been talking about, global warming and all the rest, that's dark stuff, because we don't know how it's going to end. But this is what the mystics teach East and West, that in this time of darkness, you should stick around, because there's something to learn from this. Mm. The, the Haf Hafiz, the great Sufi mystic, says, sometimes God wants to do us a great favor, turn us upside down and shake all the nonsense out. <laughs> but most everyone I know, when they find God is in such a playful, drunken mood, he says, quickly pack their bags and hightail it out of town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the first response to to struggle and darkness is, is to get out of town. But the mystic, the warrior in us sticks around to learn uh, what's what's for real and what we're going to learn from this um, shakeup. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where we're at as a species today. Yeah. This whole trust versus, or faith versus... Uh experience thing, an analogy or a metaphor I often use is that you, know, you can starve to death standing on the sidewalk reading a restaurant menu and you can believe in it, you can think it sounds great and all that stuff, but you're going to starve unless you go in the restaurant and eat. You know, so, and maybe maybe trust helps here because if you, you, you trust it, you say, oh, this, I think this sounds like it's a good restaurant, I think I'll go in and actually eat. Then, then the menu has value, but otherwise if it's just something you're going to believe in, it, it's not worth much. Well, that's good. And that metaphor you give fits right into that other line about taste and see. Yeah, yeah. Got to, you got to taste the food, too, you know, to check it out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, tell us, what is creation spirituality? That seems to be central to your whole 
thing. Well, it is. And it's the, it's the, it's the exact mirror opposite of fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. uh, the creation tradition, first of all, it begins not with sin, because sin is a human thing. So sin, sin is about 150,000 years old, but um, uh, creation is 13.8 billion years old. So why wouldn't we want to begin at the beginning? <laughs> and, uh, and it's a blessing. It begins, therefore, with original blessing, not original sin. And of course, blessing is a theological word for goodness. So we can see goodness in the 13.8 billion years of the universe that among other accomplishments has given birth to our solar system, our, our uh, galaxy, our home, the earth, and all this beauty on the earth, and even ourselves and all the other beings. We're, they're all blessings. Uh, it, it's a good thing to be here, I think. It's a special thing. And so, um, Christ begins with the blessing, not original sin. It's the oldest tradition in the Bible. The first author in the Bible, Genesis, is the J source, and that source is about how the earth is good and very good. Uh, the, the story about Adam and Eve and all that, which, by the way, is not about original sin. It's about the fall, but not original sin. No Jew believes in original sin. No Jew ever has. Jesus never heard of original sin. No Jew's ever heard of original sin. Ali Weissel said the idea of original sin is alien to Jewish thinking. Not only is it not in the Jewish Bible, it's alien to Jewish thinking. Da, and Jesus was a Jew. So what is this? Fourth century AD, St. Augustine is the first one to use the term original sin. And that was at the time when Christianity inherited the Roman Empire. If we're gonna run an empire, original sin's a great idea. And it gets everybody in line. Mm. And it gets everybody to sign up for, for killing people in the name of the empire. And, um, but it, it's not a Christianity. It's not what Christ was about. The Christ spiritual tradition uh, comes from uh, the prophetic tradition, but also the wisdom tradition. And all scholars today agree that Jesus, historical Jesus, comes from the wisdom tradition of Israel. The wisdom tradition is not book-based, it's nature-based. There are many scholars who say in his time, Jesus was considered illegitimate in his village. So he was not allowed in the synagogue on the Sabbath. So while others went to the synagogue to pray on the Sabbath, Jesus went into nature to pray. And, and you see it in all of his teachings. All of his parables are about how nature works. Obviously, he spent a lot of time in nature. And that was before his adolescence when he spent time in the desert with the wild man, John the Baptist. And, uh, and he lived among the lions, which there were were plenty of lions in the Israeli desert at that time. Mm. But Jesus grew up in Galilee, which is the, I like to say the Wisconsin, we can say the Iowa of, of, of Israel because it's the green part, mm. it's the farming part. And so he had this very close relationship to nature and the whole wisdom tradition is about that, finding divinity and wisdom in nature itself. And um, this tradition is feminist because um, uh, feminism is, uh, is, is Sophia wisdom hakma is feminine and wisdom looks at the big picture so in the in the wisdom books of the Bible we're told that um, wisdom was with God before the creation of the world uh, delighting to be with the sons and daughters of the human race so there's a sense of delight awe wonder creativity and even eros in the biblical picture of wisdom that Jesus uh, imbibed. And, and then historically, our greatest mystics, Hildegard of Begin, John, uh, 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 Thomas Aquinas, Meister Eckhart, uh, Julian of Norwich, uh, Nicholas of Cusa, all these people, and Francis of Assisi, clearly, were, were creation-centered in their spirituality. That is to say, they were not anthropocentric. They found God in all of nature. Aquinas says, Revelation comes in two volumes the Bible, and nature. And this is why Aquinas was so interested in Aristotle, because in the 13th century when Aquinas lived, Aristotle was, was just being translated by It was a big explosion of science. Uh, 
part of of Christianity because he said a mistake about creation results in a mistake about God. So we have to listen to science and uh, and scientists. And that truth is just as alive today, more alive today maybe than it was in the 13th century. And the opposition, the fundamentalists, not only of religion but of uh, politics, are, uh, are, 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 are uttering the same uh, shibboleths in our time. So um, Christian spirituality is feminist, uh, and it seeks a, a balance of, of the masculine and feminine, as we've talked about already. And it's about creativity. That it's not just that creation is continually being born, but also humans are invited to be co-creators. Uh, we are part of the, of the work of the Holy Spirit of creation. Like Aquinas says, the, the, the same spirit that hovered over creation at the beginning hovers over the mind of the artist at work. It's a beautiful Beautiful thought that uh, the, 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 the artist of the universe itself is still at work and through us. We are part of that co-creation. We're part of the work. That's the work of, of us in alignment with Holy Spirit. So um, uh, this tradition is prophetic. This is why we haven't heard about it. When, when Christianity was running the empire, as I said, that's when fall redemption or dualistic fundamentalist religion took over. And you had these th these movements that tried to break through the Celtic tradition, for example. And Hildegard, though she was German, comes out of a Celtic monastery in Germany. And she very much imbibed that sense of the sacredness of creation, the cosmic Christ of creation, not just the Christ in the historical Jesus. It's the Christ in all beings. This is the basis of the cosmic Christ teaching, that all beings are other Christs. And this is not heresy. This is not new age 20th century thought. This is found in the earliest sources of Christianity. It's found in the, uh, God, in the epistles of Paul, who's the first writer in the Christian Bible, and in the Gospel of Thomas, which is earlier than any of the four Gospels are. The cosmic Christ in the Gospel of Thomas, it says, uh, uh, split a log and I am there. Lift up a rock and I am there. Those I am sayings, are the cosmic Christ sayings. It's the divinity in all things. So um, this, in a, in a nutshell, is what Christ spirituality is about. Okay. And these great mystics are uh, have tried to live it, and many of them were were condemned or on the fringes, so forth, because uh, it does not fit well into a well-organized uh, system of church um, polity. So. Does it say, I, I presume you just quoted the Gnostic Gospels when you mentioned Thomas, and, um, and perhaps even the, the, whatever you call them, the official Gospels, does it say someplace that God is omnipresent? Um, is that what we mean by the cosmic Christ? Because if so, then how could sin be our core or our essence? Because God's got to be our core or essence if he's really omnipresent. Well, exactly. Sin is not our core and essence. Sin is choices that we make. Sin is choices yeah. that we make. That's Missing the, the mark. Point. Um, but the cause of Christ is present in all the Gospels. Um, for example, uh, this is what our, the book you held up there about the stations of the cause of Christ are about. Mm -hmm. All the great stories, there you go, yeah. in the um, <clears throat> Christian tradition, <clears throat> for example, um, in John 1, it says that Christ is a light in all things. Mm -hmm. Well, now science tells us there are photons in every atom in the universe. Mm -hmm. Well, a photon is a light wave. So there we have it. That's the Christ in all things. And, and it's a blessing. It's a good thing to have light in all things. Um, but also, for example, the, the birth narratives, the nativity. Uh, this is set in a cosmic context because you have the stories of the, of the, uh, the star that the Magi followed. That's cosmic. Or the animals that were present at the manger. That's cosmic. The four-legged ones were there the shepherds who were there and were the first to hear the news from the angels. And of course, the angels are cosmic beings. It's just filled, it's flooded with cosmic um, uh, uh, imagery. And then you go to the baptism, which is the, the opening of Mark's gospel, which is the oldest of the four gospels, Mark 1, where we're told the sky opened up when Jesus was baptized. And, and a voice said, I hear my beloved. And then the transfiguration experience, where Jesus took three disciples to the top of a mountain, 
and they experienced the radiance that was in him and is in all of us. Mm -hmm. And um, so you can go through all the great events, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, the Pentecost, all are set in a cosmic context. But our narcissism, our anthropocentrism of religion have reduced this to, oh, I am saved, and of course you aren't, <laughs> and uh, I'm a sinner, and all this. It's just totally missed the point, mm -hmm. totally missed the point of the of the, 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 the revelation, the insight that Jesus was really trying to unleash. And you already quoted, and, and that was fabulous, Matthew 25, do it to the least, you do it to me. Now that's an interesting passage because that is historical Jesus telling a story about the cosmic Christ, which is rare. You, the cosmic Christ really came to, came to the fore after Jesus died and they started writing up what had happened to them as a result of his presence and teaching. But here we have the historical Jesus saying, I'm not just Jesus, neither are you, just you. We are one another. We are especially one another when we are when we meet people who are suffering. So the hungry, you do it to me. The, the naked, you clothe me. The, visit the prisoner, you visit me, and so forth. That's the essence of Jesus' teaching, Matthew 25. And it is cosmic Christ teaching, that we all other Christ. And so that means we not only carry the light and the the awesome beauty of divinity in us, but also we carry the wounds. Uh, the Christ is wounded. The Christ is not just full of light, but it also has wounds. And that's an important contribution, I think, of the, of the Christian story, that divinity gets wounded when it enters history too. And so we share one another's wounds and we share one another's glory. And it's that combination that is the cosmic Christ. Mm. One thing I find very helpful is that um, if you just think about what science has told us about the way things work, anything, pick anything. I mean, pick a single cell. It's it's more complex than the city of Tokyo, um, and, <laughs> and we don't understand. We really don't understand a heck of a lot about it. We understand a lot, but boy, we 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 know less than you know. You know what I'm saying? And uh -huh. and we have a hundred trillion of them in our bodies, <laughs> and and they're all perfectly orchestrated and coordinated with one another. And and that's just you know, and that's just our body. Um, yeah. I mean, take another example. In, in a single gram of hydrogen, if you took all the atoms and made them the size of uncooked popcorn per kernels, they would bury the continental United States nine miles deep. And every single one of those little atoms is perfectly or orchestrated little thing and, com and completely coordinated with all the other ones in that gram of hydrogen. And, and on and on. You can take this out to any extent you want to the, throughout the entire universe. So there's this immense, vast, incomprehensible intelligence functioning in every little iota of creation. That to me is like God hiding in plain sight. I mean, <laughs> um, and, and so talk about cosmic Christ. I mean, it's, yeah. it's just that we're, and I think awe is one of the first steps in a, some four-step process that you'll probably talk about in a minute. That to mm -hmm. me is awe-inspiring, just the, just, and, and I can't forget it as I walk down the street or mm -hmm. do anything. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about what am I actually looking at here? And, and mm -hmm. the, the sort of immensity of intelligence that is in every little particle in so-called ordinary, everyday reality. Well, that's just beautiful what you offered there. And those examples are, are stunning and and absolutely real. It's good science and it's good poetry, you know. Um, and and again, is learning not to take for granted, isn't it? That this is the kind of world we're living in, and it's all marvelous, you know. Um, Einstein was once pushed, once pushed by a fundamentalist preacher, "You don't believe in miracles. You don't believe in miracles." <laughs> and Einstein said, "I beg your pardon." He said, "I believe in marvels every day." I believe in the marvels that Leibniz and Spinoza have uncovered. And he went on and on. But he, he, he brought the real meaning of miracle back, and that is to marvel. Mm -hmm. And you, you've brought that forward, see, that we can marvel at the wonders of our bodies and the wonders at, of, of this earth. And the wonders now, of course, we now know the universe is two trillion galaxies big, which is, well, marvelous. It's astonishing. It's, it, it takes your, your breath away to know that. You know, one scientist said that what that means is that because each universe contains uh, hundreds of billions of stars, each galaxy. he said it means that there are more stars in the universe now that we know than there are sands of grain on all the beaches 
in on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> and a star is a really big thing. A star is like our sun, after all. It is. So, you know, that too is pretty darn marvelous. So you can go from the microcosm, as you did talking about the cell, to the macrocosm, and everything, it's all interconnected. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's the basis of what compassion means. Compassion is simply responding to interconnectivity. When Jesus says, you know, I'm not just me, I'm you, I'm you suffering, I'm you naked, I'm you hungry, that's interconnectivity. So that's physics is now, this is what gives me optimism. Physics has now returned to the mystical uh, awareness of the interconnectivity of all things. So you got those two things together, science and mysticism. And clearly, this is a basis of compassion. So our species could, it's not at all clear that we will, but we could move into this new path, which is a path of compassion. And that's the heart, like the Dalai Lama says, we can do away with all religion, but we can't do away with compassion. Compassion is my religion, he says. Well, Jesus in Luke 6 says, be you compassionate like your creator in heaven is compassionate. So all the traditions are calling us to compassion. Uh, compassion in the Jewish tradition is the secret name for God. And Jesus let the secret out of the way. And then in the Quran, by far, the most common adjective applied to Allah is Allah, the compassionate one. Mm. So here, this is grounds for optimism, or at least for hope, that uh, science and healthy religion uh, uh, can agree on interdependence therefore our behavior mirroring that as compassion uh do it to the least you do it to me and that would be a whole new ethic for our um for our species to live by yeah unfortunately it's still new <laughs> speaking of ethic i gave a talk at the sand conference this year about the ethics of enlightenment and one point i brought up is that um that compassion and and you know altruistic behavior should, it seems to me, be natural consequences of gen a genuine spiritual attainment. And if one is seeing behavior to the contrary, then we might question that the attainment of the person who's behaving that way. Um, I don't know, do you have any comments on that before we go on? Well, I certainly do. And of course, I always push my Buddhist friends to define enlightenment for me. Mm. And um, because I define it as compassion. And some of them do. Well, that's a symptom of it, at least. Hopefully. Well, maybe a symptom, but I, I kind of think that's really what it means because um, compassion is a way of seeing the world and and being in the world and also seeing divinity and being in the presence of divinity. And but it's also an action. Um, and so um, but I, I like to push people on that. Our, I think it's an important question. Is enlightenment and compassion really the same thing? Um, and for the very reason you just gave. And it's like Jesus, who said, um, you'll, you'll know them by their fruits. Right. So it's not left enough to go around and say, I'm enlightened, I'm enlightened. Well, what are the fruits of this? For example, a lot of these gurus who have have had their breakthroughs and their, their satoris and they think they're enlightened. But, you know, what do they do with the money they make? I, I think that's a very valid question. They're driving around in Rolls Royces or something? Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. uh, to me, that's not compassion. And then, of course, we've heard there's been plenty of revelations of of sexual predatory behavior in religious groups, not just your pedophile priest scandals, but also Pretty in a lot of these ashrams as well. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I think, you know, I, I think um, it's always good to put humility first and to realize whatever we are or not, uh, we are just a channel for grace bigger than ourselves. But the evidence of the grace being present is, I think, uh, our compassion. Yeah, when you think, when you speak of compassion though, what comes to my mind is a kind of a cart and horse situation where, for instance, when Christ was being nailed to the cross, he said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. So what he was saying is, these guys can't help it because they don't have the capacity to be compassionate. They haven't been given the opportunity to develop that. Um, and it seems to me that you know, getting into the sort of mystical experience of oneness that we've been talking about will provide the foundation for the appreciation of the unity of all things, in which case you, you couldn't possibly nail nails into somebody's wrist um, because you'd be nailing them into your own, uh, or you couldn't possibly dis despoil the environment because you'd be 
you know, polluting your own body and so on. So it's, it's kind of like, again, cart, cart and horse. If mm-hmm. you, you can't just you cajole somebody into being compassionate, you have to give them the opportunity to develop some inner capacity uh, mm-hmm. based upon which compassion will be a spontaneous flow, don't you think? Well, I agree, and even that's compassionate to instruct people, yeah, uh, and to to help them out of their ignorance, um, to assist them out of their ignorance, and um, uh, you know, I, I think it's a Hindu tradition that says really all all sin is is born of ignorance, yeah, and um, but ignorance, you know, sometimes we choose ignorance. That's what denial is, um, and we have to be careful. All ignorance is not innocent. Um, and I give you a story about that because we were talking about climate change uh, a year and a half ago. It was January of 2016. It was during the presidential primaries. Um, I was invited to be part of a conference on um, climate change and seas rising in Florida. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, it was a weekend thing. And it began with a scientist who got up and showed uh, slides of Florida today, sides of Florida, 10 years from today, chop, 20 years from today, chop, chop. 30 years from today, chop, chop, chop. You know, the lesson I, I received was don't, don't buy land in Florida. Yeah, really. I might invest in, in dinghies and rubber <laughs> boots. But anyway, um, at that time, there were three major politicians in Florida, two senators, uh, one senator and ex-governor running for, off, for president, and the, the sitting governor, all three of whom were in denial about climate change. All right, Rubio and Scott, as I recall. Uh, exactly, Scott and um, Marco Rubio and and Bush. Right. And I visited South Miami, and there were six inches of water on the sidewalks. So, and and then this conference, we had a scientist telling us what's happening to Florida because of climate change. So the power of denial—that's willful ignorance. And Thomas Aquinas has something very powerful to say about that. He says people who choose to be ignorant about something that's important uh, are committing a mortal sin, meaning there is something deadly. It's, it's a deadly virus for them, their own souls and for others. And so um, we can't just let ignorance off the hook. Sometimes it's involuntary, but sometimes it's voluntary. Uh, people choose denial. And, um, and, and, uh, and then uh, Meister Eckhart says denial, uh, God is the denial of denial. I really like that. What's God that is a denial of denial. Uh-huh. Where there's denial acceptance, reigns. Then it means acceptance. Well, d- divinity is absent because there's no truth. Right. And divinity, by any standard, is about truth. So, um, so well, on the one hand, uh, we can forgive one another for ignorance, but on the other hand, we have to challenge one another. Is our ignorance purposeful? Is is it deliberate? And I think a lot of denial is deliberate ignorance. And that's happening on a big scale in our in our time today, and it has to be uh, addressed. Well, I think a lot of these guys actually know that there's a problem, and but the guys who give them money to run for office and so on uh, want them to say a certain thing, so they say it because they want to be in office. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So what's that? Isn't that selling your soul? It really is. You know. And it, it's also condemning. It's committing as. Uh, Michael Dowd likes to say intergenerational genocide because you're condemning untold numbers of people to death, essentially, <laughs> by, by your exactly. actions. Well, that's right. And ecocide, it's the killing of, of Mother Earth, which is the cosmic Christ. You see, to me, it is crucifying the Christ all over again. Mm-hmm. Because if the Christ is in all things, then that means tearing down a rainforest is crucifying the Christ or destroying, as you started earlier when we began, the, the species expasm. Christ is the elephants. Christ is the tigers that are disappearing, the polar bears that are disappearing. So it's the crucifixion all over again in the name of the empire again. Not the Roman Empire, but a new empire. Hmm. As you say, the, the, the decision makers uh, and the, the big corporations and whatnot that are, um, are uh, choosing to be ignorant even though when we when we when we find their documents, for example, Exxon, we've learned, was talking about climate change like what thirty years yeah, ago, back in the eighties, back in the eighties, and that. yet all their public positions were like a lot of politicians still. Uh, what me worry? What me worry? <laughs> so, 
it's you know the human race is a piece is a piece of work <laughs> you know we're so brilliant that we can convince ourselves after a while and certainly go out and try to convince others of our um, chosen ignorance yeah okay now you've alluded to meister eckhart a few times and um we want to keep talking about him bringing him into the conversation you've also we haven't really alluded much to my to matthew uh don't, we've, you're Matthew Fox to Thomas Merton, um, but um, I think we want to talk about him a little bit too. Um, I guess he was one of the, he, he got on the creation spirituality bandwagon, and um, in, in your book you talk about um, the four paths of creation spirituality, um, which you'll articulate better than I. So maybe you could. Would you like to talk about that now? Would that be a useful thing? Sure. Okay. That's the. Uh the real skeleton or structure uh, behind creation spirituality, mm -hmm. really asking the question, what is the spiritual journey that we all make? And, um, and uh, we name it this way, the via positiva, which is the path of awe and wonder, joy and delight. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about that earlier. Uh, taste and see that, that life is good. Uh, the via negativa has two aspects to it. One is silence, letting go of images, um, uh, meditation. This you might call the, the Buddhist element, although contemplation is found in all traditions. Uh, the Jewish tradition says, uh, be still and learn that I am God. So it is about that stillness, that emptying. But the Fiyo Negativa is also about suffering and how we deal with suffering and loss and grief. Uh, and the, and we, we talked earlier about the dark night of the soul, for example, where you come to a place where you can only feel the darkness around you. Um, I think our, our culture does a very bad job here. I think, for example, uh, we presume that all depression uh, is, is psychological and, and a pill will, will handle things. Mm -hmm. Or all pain even can be handled by a pill. That's where a lot of this, this opioid uh, epidemic is happening and so forth. But the truth is that all spiritual traditions talk about um, the need to enter suffering, to enter it, not to just cut it off, but there's something to be learned there. And um, uh, I think that that we, we clearly oversell um, uh, external cures for what often is, not always, but often is in fact a spiritual uh, plummeting that we're going that we're going into. So the via negative is about learning to let go and to let be. Then the via creativa comes next. That's about creativity, and we've we've alluded to that. How the Holy Spirit itself co-creates with us. You have to go through the emptying process of the via negativa be, before you really give birth, and uh, that's what the via creativa is about. It's about birthing, um, and you develop it through through artist meditation. The Via Negativa uh, brings in meditation as an emptying process, but the Via Creativa is about meditation as a birthing process. And it, it, we could be approaching art and, and creativity from the point of view of meditation, not just from the point of view of producing an object. And then the fourth path is the Via Transformativa. That's a path of justice and healing, of compassion that we've talked about, and also celebration. This is a culmination of the other paths. In a way, we're here to to be to learn compassion, as you said. And I think these four paths help us to learn compassion. First, you have to fall in love with life. That's the via positiva. Then you have to learn to let go and let be. That's the via negativa. Then you learn to give birth. But to give birth to what? Because creativity in itself can be uh, for for good or evil. Uh, coming up with gas ovens for the Holocaust, that took creativity, mm -hmm. but uh, it, 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 it needed to be guided by the, the value of justice and compassion, which of course it was not. So um, I think these four paths are very archetypal. I think they round out the, the fullness of our spiritual journey, but, but we're always moving. So even the via transformative is not the last word because um, uh, what you want to do is you lead more people because of justice and healing, you lead more people into the via positiva, into the joy and the wonder, the awe and the gratitude for living. So the whole cycle starts over again. So that's how, how Christ Spiritual names the journey. And um, 
uh, I think it's, um, I, what can I say? I, I was in a dialogue with Robert Thurman the other day, the Buddhist scholar, mm -hmm. and he said, you know, uh, I want to talk another time about how your four paths uh, hold, up, hold up to the, to the four uh, noble truths of Buddhism. So I'm looking forward to that next dialogue we're going to have on mm. that subject. Yeah, my most recent interview with him is the is the most is the one I most recently put up on that gap. He, he and Isa Gucciardi. Oh yes, yeah. Yeah, right. They were in Yeah, that's. I was with both of them that day at a public event at her Buddhist center in Berkeley. Oh, good. One him. one thing that strikes me when I hear you describe these four paths is that they might develop sequentially, or they might develop independent of one another and, and become out of balance, like you were saying, it took creativity to make the gas chambers. Um, but ideally, and in my experience for the most part over the decades, uh, they have sort of developed in sync simultaneously. Um, not as, and so it's not like these are separate paths that one would choose one or another according to one's temperament. These are like four components of a holistic spiritual development. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You put it very well. And um, for example, uh, if you have a healthy parenting and you're as a child and a healthy family is very likely that they're, they're going to develop exactly in that order. But if you've been abused or something, then it may be the via negativa that comes forward first in your life. And um, for example, too, with addicts, for example. Uh, Father B. Griffiths, the, the monk from India, used to say that some people um, do not experience spirit until they experience despair. That uh, despair is a yoga. Uh, and, and you see that, I think, in a lot of AA people or, or other people involved in, in, the, in issues of, of addiction. That their bottoming out happens um, and then they begin to get their life together, or if you will, to experience spirit or God or what have you for the first time. Yeah, that happened and, to me, actually. But, I mean, I was dropped out of high school and I was getting arrested uh, and doing drugs and even heroin and stuff. And then finally, I, I was sitting reading a Zen book one day while on LSD, and I thought, you know, I'm really going nowhere. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and these guys that I'm reading about here were pretty serious. I think I'd better, like, take a hint and get on a more positive track. So I learned to meditate and so on. But anyway, uh -huh. and, and I do, uh, I've also interviewed people who say that for them, suffering was a huge awakening tool, which they wouldn't have signed up for, but which came upon uh -huh. them and, and kind of like put them through a catharsis that resulted in a major shift. Sure, yeah. that woke them up. Yeah. And also when you, when that's your, your path, um, you become the wounded healer then, you know, the compassion yeah. uh, really rises because you've been there. Right, you can relate and, to others. And you know, you know what the other person's going through. And that's where, for example, in AA, where, where uh, members support one another and so forth, that's really a big part of the, of the journey, a big part of the healing. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's a beautiful story uh, that you share that with us. And of course, a lot of saints have had that ex kind of experience, where they've had their breakdown and with that, a breakthrough experience. Um, but uh, but again, I, I think it, it doesn't hurt to put the <laughs> what can I say the healthier version out there. Oh yeah. So we can see for one thing what what we were missing, what drove what drives people into into um, into dark areas, and uh, and so forth. Uh, but uh, but even it comes back to that. I mean, you obviously have found a lot of joy. In the work you do, you're doing now, and in in the work that you did in meditation and all the rest. So, so you've tasted the via positiva too. But as you say, perhaps the cycle was a little bit, a little bit um, uh, out of uh, out of tune for a while. Yeah, but I the, think different people have different karma, obviously, and absolutely different, different things different they chances. have to go through. And um, exactly, you know, so. And most people don't have an easy ride, you know, most people have, I mean, you're, you're a little bit unusual in, in that you were rather precocious and reading War and Peace at the age of 15 or something, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, so. I, I had parents who kind of... Yeah, um, you probably grew up in a healthy environment. And a neat family. But also I lost my legs at 12, so that That's really true. was the first yeah. step for me, yeah. so it was a loss. And, mm -hmm. and in some ways I separated from my father at 12 too, and I, I was looking for other versions of 
of manhood. And I, I met this uh, Dominican brother, actually, who would visit me in the hospital. And he was like the opposite of my father. He's very contemplative and he's from New Orleans and spoke with this accent I'd never heard before in my life, very slowly. And um, as it turned out, he ended up becoming a Trappist monk. Mm. But um, he kind of introduced me when I was in this rather vulnerable situation of losing my legs to the contemplative world, you know, and I, I was just fascinated. I said, oh, there's another way of being a man. Yeah. And um, so that was, you know, a part of my story, too. But mm -hmm. like you say, n none of us gets through life without wounds. Yeah. And it's the question is, you know, how uh, what the wounds have to teach us. Right. And as Leonard Cohen said, that's where the lights get in, to, to paraphrase exactly. him a bit. <laughs> exactly. Um, I love Leonard Cohen, too. Yeah. Let's talk about Merton a bit. Um, you, you've written a couple of books yeah. about him. Um, why is he so important to you that you've written a couple of books about him? Well, um, personally speaking, I did read him when I was a teenager, mm -hmm. um, uh, his uh, Seven Story Mountain, his autobiography, and it influenced me. What I, what I liked most about it was the, the contemplative side um, that was just awakening in me. And of course, this fellow had become a monk after being very much of a playboy and a, a whirly kind of guy uh, as a young man. Then he joined the monastery and, um, and he tells us that story there. But um, in the early 60s, I went to my Dominican superiors. I was still in training then. And I said, my generation is going to be less interested in religion and more interested in spirituality. And I said, you don't have anyone teaching spirituality here. So you should send someone on for a doctorate in spirituality, and I'm happy to volunteer. So they came to me a while later and said, well, good news, you can go to Europe and get a doctorate in spirituality. I said, great, where do I go? They said, go to Spain. I said, Spain, we don't need more 16th century Spanish spirituality. Mm. Well, they said, go to Rome. Rome, I said, for spirituality, are you kidding me? Well, wise guy, they said, where, where do you think you should go? I said, I don't know. Let me write Thomas Merton. They thought I was crazy. So I wrote Merton, and four days later, I got a full-page letter saying, go to Paris. So I, they, they, they said, well, I brought it to them. And they said, we never sent anyone to France who came home again, so you can't go to Paris. <laughs> oh, but I have to, Merton says, no, no. So for three months, we battled. I hit him over the head with Merton's letter, and finally they relented and said, okay, go to Paris. And that's where I went to the Institute Catholique, and I met my mentor there, Pierre Chenu, a wonderful 75-year-old French Dominican, uh, who, um, who named the creation of spiritual tradition for me. So it was really an important event for me, among other things that I learned there. And um, so I thank Merton for it. He, as I say, all the trouble I've gotten in is due to Thomas Merton, mm. because he sent me there. Merton was born in France. His parents were American, his American mother, and his New Zealand father, but they met at the Art Institute in Paris. They were both artists, fell in love, and then he was born in the south of France. And um, Merton really was an amazing figure. For me, he really was uh, uh, very intelligent uh, uh, and well-read and, and come from this artist background. He was very gifted in, in writing and in many art, other art forms as well. But um, his conversion happened in 1958, but, and he joined the monastery in 1940. But he was a dualistic monk and writer until 1958 when he encountered uh, Meister Eckhart through Suzuki, the great Zen Buddhist who brought Zen to North America. Suzuki told Merton, you should be reading the one Zen thinker of the West, which is Eckhart. And Merton said, but, but he said, Eckhart's been condemned by the church. And Suzuki said, well, I can't help that, can I? So make long story <laughs> short, Eckhart started reading, I mean, Merton started reading Eckhart and it utterly converted him. The last 10 years of his life, 1958 to 1968, Merton became a very prophetic Christian. He, in, he, it's just what we were talking about earlier in this conversation. He moved from just contemplation, it's kind of an isolated activity, into the world at large. And so his last book were on two basic topics. One was interfaith. So he was a real pioneer in deep ecumenism or interfaith. So he was writing about Buddhism and Taoism and Sufism and all of it. And of course, his last journey was to Asia, where he met the Dalai Lama, among others who was 33 at the time, and they, they really fell in love and appreciated each other profoundly. And, um, but the other uh, aspect of Merton's development and maturity was his stance on political and ecological issues. So, for example, when um, 
uh, Rachel Carson's book came out, uh, Silent Spring, which people recognize as, as the launching of the environmental movement. She was immediately castigated by scientists. They said, oh, this is a crazy woman. She's in love with trees and bunnies and birds, and uh, she's not a real scientist, blah, blah, blah. In contrast, Merton immediately read it and wrote her a four page letter thanking her, saying that she explains why the birds have disappeared on the on the monastery farm and they're going to stop doing DDT because of her book and everything like that. Um, so uh, he was right on the environmental movement like that. He was a complete uh, uh, cheerleader for Rachel Carson and the movement. And um, so he, he was writing books against the Vietnam War. He was the first religious figure to come out against it. His friend, Dr. King, um, uh, followed him. And by the way, uh, when King was murdered in Memphis, originally he was scheduled that weekend to do a retreat with Thomas Burton and Thich Nhat Hanh, the three of them together. Wow. And he called up, Merton, uh, King called Merton a few days before and said, I'm sorry, I have to cancel, we'll do a rain check. I have to march in Memphis. Mm. And Merton comments on that after the fact, of course, and says how, how history might have changed if we had done our retreat instead of King had been murdered then. But the truth is that I've, um, I've come to a conclusion that Merton himself was murdered uh, because of his stand on peace in, in Bangkok, where he, he, um, he gave a talk to about 200 monks and nuns on Karl, Karl Marx and monasticism. And three hours later, he was dead. And I've talked to three CIA agents who were in Southeast Asia at the time over the last 30 years. And uh, they've confirmed for me that he was murdered by our government. Yeah, now the, we've all heard the story about how he, he got electrocuted by a faulty fan, like stepping out of the shower wet or something and touching a fan. Mm -hmm. But um, you suggest, I mean, how would that have exactly happened? Would they have made the fan, uh, rigged the fan so it would electrocute him? No. Or was yeah, the fan was, was definitely effect, uh, rigged because uh -huh. after they found his body, one person was shocked by touching the, the cord. Uh -huh. But you have to ask, first of all, he'd arrived the day before. Did he not turn on the fan yeah. that night? Well, maybe or in he the wasn't morning, wet or before or something. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and would you step out of a shower soaking wet and plug the fan, a fan into the wall, you know, in a third world country, even yeah. though it was a brand new building, it was a solid building. Um, it makes no sense because Merton was not an abstract professor type person. He was very grounded and mm -hmm. earthy. And, um, and, uh, uh, the his monks back at the at the ranch and the monastery, when they heard that he died suddenly, they said, "Oh, he was murdered," because they knew he was getting threatening mail from the FBI and the CIA. He were also uh, listening into his phone conversations, uh, again, which was against the law even then, um, uh, and and just like they were to King at the time. Yeah. So um, it all adds up. It's and not a far-fetched notion. I mean, considering all the things the CIA it's has It's not far-fetched, and especially since I've spoken to three agents. Yeah, yeah. And I said to the first one, did you guys kill Merton? He said, well, I'll neither affirm it nor deny it. Right. I said, well, could you have a piece of cake? There's no, there was no security at the, at the retreat center. Yeah. The second one said, um, this was years later, it's actually one of my students, and he said, well, at that time, we in the CIA were flooded with cash in Southeast Asia with absolutely no... Uh, accountability whatsoever. Mm. Any CIA agent, one agent who felt Merton was a threat to the country, could have had him done in with no questions asked. Uh -huh. And the third agent, ex-agent I spoke to, it was right after the book came out a year ago. I said, did you guys kill Merton? He said, yes. Wow. In the last 40 years of my life, he said, I've been spending cleansing my soul from what I did as a young man working for the CIA in Southeast Asia in the late 60s. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, Burton, to get back to the better picture, we, we were talking about mysticism, the cosmic Christ. Here's a great story about Burton. Um, one day he had this mystical experience at noon in downtown Louisville. Louisville is the city's nearest his monster. And everyone was out for lunch, you know, busy, busy downtown. And he saw everyone, the light in everyone. Mm -hmm. And he wrote about the next day in his journal. He said, how is it possible to tell everyone they were all walking around shining like the sun hmm. as you went. That's a, just a powerful statement about the cosmic Christ. It's exactly like the transfiguration experience 
that is recorded with Jesus and his three friends at the top, but they saw him, the light in him coming out. Well, Merton saw it coming out of everybody, ordinary folks at noontime in downtown Oak, uh, uh, Louisville, of all places. Sure. So that's a, a fine example of, of a cosmic Christ experience um, uh, uh, recalled, uh, written about by a, a bona fide mystic and prophet, namely sure. Thomas Merton. And I know people I've, who tend to see the world that way all the time. It's not just a uh -huh. flashy experience uh -huh. on a street corner, but it's their, it's their uh -huh. normal everyday reality. Ah, uh -huh. well, that's that's the heart of the cosmic Christ uh, experience, and you know, I I'm sure use someone like Christ did too. You know, someone like Christ. I, I'm sure someone like Christ saw the world that way all the time too. Yeah, yeah, and um, and, the, and of course the Buddhists have another word for it: the Buddha nature. Yeah, like I was lecturing in South Korea a couple of years ago, and a Buddhist monk came up afterwards, and he said, "I've never heard this term, cosmic Christ. I really like it." He said. I'm going to go around preaching now about the cosmic Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And um, now there's been a major study by a, a Jewish rabbi, David Seidman, uh, on the image of God, uh, Salem in Hebrew. And his his question is it's a real scholarly work. He goes through all the Jewish tradition, the Bible, the uh, the, the, the the Midrash, the rabbinic teachings, uh, Moses Maimonides, uh, Hasidism, all the way up to today, asking one question. Is image of God apply in Judaism only to the human, or does it apply to all beings? Mm. And he concludes, it applies to all beings. And this gives him, he says, a, a Jewish basis for an ecological theology, an eco-theology. But I pointed out to him exactly what he says. Like he talks about the pattern that connects. Well, that's exactly one of the phrases that Paul uses of the cosmic Christ. So here we have three major traditions, Buddhism, Christianity, and, and Judaism talking about the same reality, just a little bit different language. But you also have it, of course, in Hinduism, where the primordial man, and you have it, of course, in, in, in indigenous theology too. So really, this is an archetypal way of seeing the world that we have to get back to. You know, Einstein, I quote him in my stations book, it's just an amazing passage. He says, we're now entering the third phase of religion. The third phase of religion is a cosmic religion. We have to move religion beyond nationalism. Of course, he's speaking out of the, the Holocaust experience and the Second World War, which, of course, he was very disappointed by how little the churches stood up to Hitler. Some individuals did in the churches, but as or institutions, they, they didn't do enough. And uh, he says this cosmic religion uh, it must become the basis of all religion today, and this would become the basis of world peace. He goes on and on. It's just a brilliant piece, an amazing piece. But it's it's really what we're talking about, the sense of the cosmic Christ or the Buddha nature or the image of God that's in all beings um, as individuals, but also in the whole the whole picture, the macrocosm of the universe as well. <laughs> Here's something you'll find amusing. I was emailing with my friend Dana Sawyer the other day. I don't know if you know Dana. He's a professor of comparative religions at Maine College of Art and He's been on back, mm. been on back gap. He helped me interview um, Robert Thurman a couple of years ago, and mm. uh, in any case, he's he says in a couple in two weeks I'll be speaking at the Acad the American Academy of Religion conference in Boston, defending the vi the views of Houston Smith against his detractors as scholars assess his legacy. This will mostly be a fight over whether or not the academy will allow theories of reality that include metaphysical elements. So it'll be a heated debate. And huh. the reason I find that amusing is that, geez, I mean, how can one actually comprehend reality without incorporating the metaphysical dimension? You know, because reality is not just what we see on the surface. It, you know, it's the, it's the sort of the even physics tells us that if you really want to know reality, go deep. Um, so exactly. the fact that the American Academy of Religion wow. would have a problem with that seems yeah. like they're, I don't know, scary. strange to me. <laughs> it's scary. But let me ask you, how would you define metaphysics or the metaphysical reality? Um, well, I'll do my best. Um, maybe I would evoke physics itself and, and say that, you know, physics tells us that that which appears physical is not. And so to go beyond the, 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 the apperception of things as merely physical is to get into metaphysics and to realize that, you know, um, more fundamentally, the apparently physical universe is non-physical and it gets down to the level of it being consciousness 
that if you want to really get to the ultimate substratum, consciousness <laughs> itself is the foundation, and not only the foundation, but the actual substance of everything. It just appears, consciousness takes the form of apparent physical concrete reality, but it's actually just con nothing but consciousness if you, if you appreciate it properly. Mm -hmm. so that's my well, definition. <laughs> I, 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 I like that. We could have a long conversation on that. Yeah. Um, we can, I, uh, we, can, we can do that right now. It doesn't have to be long, but we can. <laughs> well, I think another dimension to that, just mm -hmm. then, some more language for it, mm -hmm. is um, about being, yeah. being and relationship. And I think of, um, I think of uh, Lakota people when they pray Ahob Itakiyasi, all our relations, and and um, and then what we're learning about being about uh, things is that ultimately they are relationships more than things. Mm -hmm. And this is, to me, is at the heart of metaphysics or the deeper meaning of physics, as you say. And, and, and then, of course, how relationships um, involve consciousness. Like Hildegard of Bingham, the 12th century said, there is no being uh, that lacks an inner life. There is no being that lacks an inner life. Well, to me, that's very parallel to what you just said about mm -hmm. consciousness, and um, uh, you know, and and Meister Eckhart, the 14th century, said that uh, relation is the essence of everything, mm. everything in the universe. Now, to me, this is 21st century physics. Yeah, uh, but it's also mystical intuition or awareness uh, from not only his experience in the 14th century, but from traditions around the world, uh, including indigenous traditions. So um, it's really scary and appalling to hear that the American Academy of Religion is so afraid of going beyond religion as, as uh, defined by sociological or institutional or doctrinal um, categories, and unwilling to go into the, the deeper metaphysic, if you will, or the deeper level of relationship, of consciousness, of being itself. Mm -hmm. And um, this is what I love about the mystics. This is why I, I wanted to study them and, and be with them so much in my last 50 years of my life, because I found there people who were willing to take that adventure, to explore what, that, what those relationships are, what those experiences are, to use your earlier word. Mm -hmm. And then to see that science is, is is kind of um, uh, circling this itself today, is 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 just wonderful. But to think that a, a, an academy like AAR is is afraid of this, I don't know. It just shows you where the academy is at. I think yeah. education is part of the problem today and not part of the solution. I really do, in great part. It's uh, it's stuck, I think, in modern consciousness, and the rest of us are trying to uh, move into a postmodern awareness. And on this note of relationships, um, coming back to consciousness, um, both in the Vedic tradition, and I've heard kind of a parallel explanation of this from quantum physicists, uh, if con consciousness, and physics wouldn't use that term, but to speak in the Ved more Eastern terms, if consciousness is the ultimate reality uh, and the, the actual totality of, of what is, then what has it got to relate with other than itself? And so, uh, on the uh, sort of a primordial level, consciousness self interacts, and and the self interaction of consciousness sets up the sort of conditions where apparent diversity arises, um, and the, the whole universe is a sort of a an expression of the sort of the dynamism at the most fundamental level of creation that results from the continuous sort of one and three interaction of consciousness with itself, the three being observer, observed, and process of observation, which actually can't exist if there's really only one, but, but arise from the interaction of consciousness with itself. And there's a sort of an infinite frequency back and forth between this one and three and one and three and one and three. And this kind of gives rise to the whole explosion of, of creativity that we see as the universe. Mm. Mm. <laughs> well, I like that. Now, Thomas Aquinas, I uh, use his interesting language for this, and I like it. He says that um, God is supremely conscious and therefore supremely joyful. Mm, nice. 
And I just like that relationship between joy and consciousness. And then he says, sheer joy is God's, and this demands companionship. Mm -hmm. So this is his way of talking about the purpose of the universe. The purpose of the universe is joy. Yes. And joy of all beings. And he talks about the, all beings being joyful and being friends to one another and so forth. And um, I just think it's, it's very fresh language. Uh, and um, at least to most Westerners it is. But uh, I do think it's, it's imperative that we bring joy and consciousness again into our conversation about reality. You know, I mean, duh. But, you know, this is what the modern age did. It just so narrowed the questions uh, that, uh, you know, and it, it hasn't been a total loss. Obviously, we've learned a lot from from modern consciousness and the modern science. But in this postmodern time, we've got to open open our, our minds again and bring in some of this pre-modern wisdom. You see, Aquinas was a pre-modern thinker. And so he thought in terms of the universe. For example, he says, the most excellent thing in the universe is not the human. The most excellent thing in the universe is the universe itself. Hmm. And, and this comes very close to what you're saying, too, that consciousness is, 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 um, is bouncing around the entire universe. And we, we are, 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 are part of that, for sure. And, uh, but, but again, that the joy is, is at the heart of things uh, and at the heart of consciousness itself. And this is the, the context in which we find ourselves or ought to find ourselves. Uh, and of course, it means we have to redo all of our uh, work worlds, our professions, uh, uh, including education, to bring joy back and with it consciousness. And, uh, you know, so we've got a lot of work ahead of us, I think. Yeah. Maharshi Mahesh Yogi used to be fond of saying the expansion of happiness is the purpose of creation. Oh, oh, well, that's real close that's to... Kind of just what you were saying, or what Aquinas exactly. was saying. Exactly. Yeah. And, of course, the, in the Eastern traditions, they talk about Ananda or bliss, and Sat Chit Ananda mm -hmm. being the sort of, you know, existence, consciousness, bliss, being the sort of essential constituents of ultimate reality. Um, exactly. And, yeah, go ahead. and Eckhart is very big on that, on being. He says, when it comes to being, we're equal to all the other creatures. We're not superior. Mm. That that we all have being in, in common, and uh, I just like that that pre-modern awareness that we have to get back to being, mm -hmm. and um, and and he also says you know we should we should act out of our being, uh, action should follow on being, <laughs> and. Um, yeah. You know, that's just such good advice. Yeah, you know, the Bhagavad Gita actually says, established in being, perform action. There you go. Yeah. Right. And and the, the Upanishads say that uh, there's joy in creating. Yeah. And there's creating in joy. Mm -hmm. So the via creativa, you see, that path is a path of joy. In, in our creativity, there's, there's great bliss. There's great satisfaction and union and communion yeah. in... Um, in our creativity, and we're all creative. You know, this isn't about artists that we put on pedestals. That there's a this creative um, uh, passion in all of us. Uh, M. C. Richards, a potter, who wrote the marvelous book *Centering*, which I think is really the Bible of artist meditation. She says that um, there's a creative being inside all of us, and we must get out of its way because it will give us no peace until we do. <laughs> I just love that. You yeah. know. Real creativity is about getting out of the way of, of, the, of the creative spirit so it can do its thing with us. And, uh, and there's great joy in that. And there's great peace in that. And uh, we are, uh, that word you use, you're part of a dynamic, a dynamic world of creativity. And if it's anything that distinguishes the post Einsteinian universe from the modern consciousness, it is creativity. That this universe is still expanding and still giving birth and uh, and recycling the death uh, uh, all over the place, and uh, and we're part of it. Lo and behold, and we we as a species are very blessed with powers of creativity, but of course we have to choose them wisely, and uh, our education should be set up, I think, to put creativity first. Uh, this is my pedagogy that I've used over the decades now with adults in my various programs and universities, but also 
I used it with inner city teenagers because, you know, that's where the real crisis in education is showing. 64% mm. of black boys in America are not graduating from high school today. Mm. Why is that? Well, I've learned it's because they're bored. Because they're not being asked to be creative. They're just being having these exams dumped on them. And so we have to get back to education itself as, a, as an incubation of bringing forward the, the, the wisdom uh, that's inside all the young people. Bring that out. And then you relate it to the adult accomplishments. You don't begin with the adult accomplishments. You want to begin where the kids are. Yeah, you know, all this talk of joy and creativity and so on, it, 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 when I think, when I consider this, I can't help but think about what we were talking about earlier, the, the opioid epidemic, and, and not only that, but what you just said about education, how it's so boring for kids, and then consider how many tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people are on various kinds of tranquilizers and things that are supposed to sort of numb them down. And, um, and it's, it seems like such a shame because, and, I, and of course I attempted to do that myself in my teens, but it seems like such a shame because I think as you and I and many people listening have discovered, there is an inexhaustible reservoir of joy and, and happiness within us. And it's just a matter of tapping that. And, and you know, the vast, and so many people who are on these drugs and so on, it's like they're millionaires who are living in, uh, literally living on the streets, who have mm -hmm. forgotten that they have this great bank account that they could access. Mm -hmm. I'm talking, of course, about the bank account of the inner joy. Um, mm -hmm. But, and, and then we're all wringing our hands about what are we going to do about the opioid epidemic? There, mm -hmm. there just needs to be a sort of a, a uh, some kind of educational means whereby <laughs> the masses can be turned on to this um, inner <laughs> reservoir. And, uh, and then all these problems will just be a thing of the past, it seems to me. Well, there's a lot to be said about that for sure. Um, I did this pilot project for two years with inner city teenagers who were dropping out of school. And um, what we had them doing was making movies and murals and rap and poetry and dance and um, 100% at, at the end said they wanted to stay in school now. Yeah. And it's because they experienced the joy of creativity. Duh. And one day, an eight, uh, 18 year old boy, um, senior, he turned to me and he said, this is the first time in my life that I've expressed, been asked to express myself creatively in school. Mm. First time in his life after four years of high school, <laughs> or in the middle of fourth, his fourth year of high school. So um, yeah, I think we're, 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 we're dumbing down, on the one hand, our, our children, uh, which is boring for them, but also we're not, we're not even asked them to come forward with what's in them, with the wisdom that's in them. Yeah. And that, you know, education comes from the Latin word, adutere, to lead out. Right. It's, supposed to, it's not about stuffing, it's about leading out. Mm -hmm. Yeats, the poet, Irish poet, said that uh, education is not about filling a pail, it's about lighting a fire. Mm. And, um, so I think we need schools that light fires. And I, and I call these wisdom schools instead of knowledge factories. And because um, you light a, the fire of learning, and first of all, people are happy, but also they spend the rest of their life learning then. You know, the fire doesn't go out because you are happy. Truth, Aquinas says, the proper heart objects of the heart are truth and justice. I just love that. That the heart yearns for truth and the heart yearns for justice. So it shouldn't be that hard lighting a fire because we've all got a heart. Uh, but, you know, we've, it's, it's like bad religion that piles up doctrine upon doctrine. And, and so we pile up stuff on stuff on stuff in, in education. It gets more and more expensive and everyone is unhappy. It's not only the kids who are unhappy, the teachers are unhappy, the staff is unhappy. You know, it's, it's an unhappy place to be. Where's the joy? So, you know, we could just be doing this so much more properly but we do have to deal with the inner self and the kids. And so there's where things like yoga and uh, meditation practices and so forth are absolutely essential for, um, you know, for clearing out some of the stuff, the residue that people come with and the stuff back home and all that. Uh, they have to be the, the, we have to bring in what I'd call the inner technologies from spiritual practices and traditions. And, um, uh, all this is doable and is doable in, in a very modest, uh, at a very modest cost, because we have these 
these um, practices in our repertoire as human beings. But they've been, um, I think, uh, excluded because we've been defining education so rational a way for, for 100, 150 years yeah. that uh, we have to bring that balance back to what I call the right and left brain balance. And what, what Einstein himself called intuition versus rationality. He said, do not overtrust the intellect. It does not give you values. He says, values come from intuition. Mm -hmm. the, he said, the intellect will give you methods, but not values. So he said, we, we need both. And uh, they need to serve each other. The rational needs to serve the intuition. So that's what I opt for in, in, the, in the programs that I've designed, the pedagogy over the years. Uh, this is what we've done. And in our new school, the Fox Institute for Career Spirituality out of Boulder, we're doing this again with a new, a new leadership and everything, another generation's doing it. But um, is that a high school, I've seen college? the results. What, what, what's results the age, are amazing. What's the, age what's, group with, what's the age group of that school? Um, well, it's, it's uh, young adults and older. It's because they're offering master's degrees and uh, doctor of ministry or doctor of spirituality degrees. Uh, yeah, just opened this month, you know, last month, oh, October. Great. great. Yeah. Yeah, there are a number of initiatives like that. I, there was a woman named Caverly Morgan at the SAND conference that presented this whole program that she's doing in Portland with te teaching mindfulness to kids in schools and they're getting mm. marvelous results. You know, kids are just flourishing and, um, uh -huh. you know, not- What age kids is she dealing with? High school. High school, yeah. yeah. Great. I mean, you know, it's Great. preventing suicides, it's keeping kids in school, uh -huh. they're just getting, and it's growing like wildfire because it's doing so well. And, right. Um, you know, there's a bunch of programs like this. I just had lunch yesterday with a couple of women who are who have an educational program in the townships in South Africa uh, and mm. are having great results bringing kids off the street. And uh, obviously, Adam Bucko has has been dedicating himself to doing that kind of thing. So, you know, it's not like we don't have solutions. It's just that we haven't right. been applying them. Exactly. And then when they exactly. want to cut budgets, what do they cut? They start cutting the art, the music, the dance, all, exactly. all the creative stuff, you know, it makes it even worse. Every, all the stuff that feeds the soul and heals the soul. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. But there you have politics and education uh, linking up and yeah. coming up with bad results. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so you and I could uh. probably go on all day. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, I've got like four pages of notes here and every single mm. point is something we could have a discussion about. But mm. I think we've given people a pretty good taste. Um, I think so. I, I've enjoyed it. Yeah. It a good ride. Is there anything yeah. uh, important that I haven't thought to ask you or that you would like to say uh -huh. that you know, it just hasn't come up or anything? Well, um, <clears throat> One project I'm involved in now, uh, we just launched it this month, is a new order, a spiritual order. We're calling it the Order of the Sacred Earth. Hmm. And the directors, one is a woman, 28, and the man is 33. So mm -hmm. I'm working with these young people. But it is meant to be intergenerational. We just came out with a book called Order of the Sacred Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, intergenerational Love in Action, I think it's called. And um, But it is about... Um, to bring together all spiritual traditions. So you don't have to belong to any, or you could belong to a particular one, and you don't have to leave it. But the one vow that binds us together is that I promise to be the best lover of Mother Earth and the best defender of Mother Earth that I can be. That's the one vow. You can be from any lifestyle or any tradition, as I say, including atheists are involved to, or are invited too. And it's, a, it's going to be self-organizing, like most of nature is, so we'll see what, how it develops, but we're hoping to have different um, chapters or pods, as someone calls it, in different areas of the country and of the world. Uh, our first ceremony is going to be solstice, uh, December 21st. We're going to, some of us are going to make vows and be live streamed, and we're going to do it in Berkeley, actually at a Buddhist center. Mm -hmm. The Buddhist center from Ira, the woman that you interviewed with uh, Robert Thurman. Isa, actually. Isa Gucciari. Yeah, yeah. Isa, yeah. And, um, and, and we hope there'll be other groups around the country that are doing it in their locales as well. But um, my idea is this, that when I look at religious history, a religion often has a downturn. But every time there's been a big downturn, there's been an order that pops up. Mm -hmm. Because orders are much swifter to respond than religions are, or churches. And so we don't have time today for a new religion or a new church. No. But... Um, 
and some people have left religion, organized religion, a lot of people have, but some are still in. We can bring them together this way too. So an order that puts the sacredness of, of Mother Earth at the center, I think uh, has a lot of potential. For example, a 26 year old woman who heard about it, she said to me, oh my God, she said, my generation really needs us. We're so dispersed by social media. We need a focus, we need a focus. This would be perfect. But that's what a vow is, it's a focus. It's a focusing device. So I think that there's great potential in this. And I, I would, I'm looking forward to see it uh, happen and see what happens with it. So uh, we have a web page, Order of the Sacred Earth. And I say this book has just come out, although it's not coming out publicly till the spring. It's kind of out by private um, uh, distribution at this time. Yeah, I've got but, it on the uh, shelf back here. What's that? I said I have it on the shelf behind me here if I can. Oh, do you really? Yeah, there we go. Oh. You got a copy already. Wow, there I you go. A sneak a peek. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Order of the Sacred Earth. Good. Mm -hmm. So they could go to my webpage, I guess, and find out more about this or go to the webpage there. But that's that's something I, I thought it would be worth to throw in. It seems to fit with a lot of what we've been talking about. Great. And I think we need these new forms today, forms of education, forms of religion that are just travel much lighter, but in a more interfaith and ecumenical and include science and, and action. And um, let's give it a shot, see what we can do with it. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I'll link to these books and these websites and anything else you want me to link to from your page on batgap.com. So if somebody happens Please. to be listening to this while they're driving or something, don't have okay. a wreck trying to jot down notes. You can just <laughs> go to the website and, and you'll, good idea. you'll find yeah, the links. Yeah. There you go. And uh, yeah. So thanks. Uh, thank you very much, well, thank you, Matthew. Thank yeah. you for your your time and your wisdom in this program. I think it's a wonderful form by which to get uh, important ideas out there and I'm glad to be part of it. Well, I love what you're doing with your life and have been doing and I, I love people who think outside the box and just, uh, there's, a, there's an old uh, Bengali saying, which is that if no one comes on your call, then go ahead alone. And, uh, uh -huh. you know, so it seems like you've, you've kind of guided your, your own destiny by that principle in the sense that you know, whatever seems to be the best, that's what I'm going to do. I don't care what Cardinal Ratzinger thinks or anybody <laughs> else, you know. <laughs> and, and you've produced a lot through that, through that approach. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. So let me just make a couple of quick wrap-up points. Um, to those who've been listening or watching, uh, this is, as you probably know, this is an ongoing series. And if you'd like to watch other ones, if you'd like to be notified of other ones, go to batgap.com and sign up for the little email that we send out every time a new one gets posted. Um, there's an audio podcast, as I just mentioned. You can listen while you're commuting or whatever. There's a, a link on that for that on batgap.com and a number of other things if you just explore the menu. So um, thanks again, Matthew, and I uh, hope to run into you again one of these days uh, at Thank you. Sand Conference or someplace. Thank you, Rick. Enjoyed it. All right. Bye now. Bye.